Good morning, everyone. My name is Krishni Singh, and I'm the research coordinator for the Durban Research Action Partnership. So for those of you who are unfamiliar, the Durban Research Action Partnership is a partnership between Etiquini Municipality and the University of KwaZulu-Natal using research to address biodiversity, climate change, and social issues. So I'd like to welcome everybody to today's seminar on the Ingonyama Trust Sites. Thank you for attending this and thank you for, for showing interest in this topic. So um, just to give a bit of background, the purpose of the seminar is that we have been trying uh, for a while to get um, biodiversity information from the Ingonyama Trust Sites to help Itikwini Municipality with biodiversity planning and conservation. And so far we've faced many challenges. So the idea for, to, for this morning is to have a 20 to 30 minute talk um, from our speaker who will be addressing um, the following questions of what is the Ingonyama Trust, uh, where are the Ingonyama Trust sites and how do they link to the broader biodiversity of Etiquini, what makes these sites special or unique and how are they managed, what is the planned future for these sites, um, what needs to be done in terms of research and conservation, and maybe we can get a bit into what you can do um, to help. We will then have a short discussion time and we are quite keen to hear from you, your thoughts, your ideas, any specific questions you may have, um, you may want to ask the speaker. And um, also uh, it would be nice if we had a, ni uh, a nice discussion on ideas on how to get this biodiversity information. So with that, I'll introduce our speaker. Um, it's Mr. Becker Mamela from the Biodiversity Stewardship Program at the Environmental Planning and Climate Protection Department of Itikwini Municipality. So Becker, I'll um, stop sharing and you can take over from here. Yeah, thanks a lot, Prashni. Good morning, everyone. Thank you very much for this opportunity. I'm looking forward to the fruitful discussion. May you just give me a few minutes for downloading my presentation. Good morning again. I hope you can see my, my slide. Prashni, can you see the slide? Yes, thanks, Becca. Okay, thank you very much. I hope everyone can hear me. As Prashni has indicated, I'm Pega Memela from uh, Tewin Municipalities Biodiversity Planning the, uh, Branch under Environmental Planning and Climate Protection Department. I've been given this opportunity to ask uh, some questions related to Ngonyama Trust Land in particular, but with more emphasis on the questions related to research. But of course, I'm not a researcher. The only, the best I can do is to indicate firstly, to answer the question around what is in Gonyama Trust Land with more emphasis on the stakeholders that are involved there. But I'll also give some background in terms of why we are interested in working on in Gonyama Trust Land. What is our interest? What is so special about in Gonyama Trust Land? But I also, touch on the, on the question of management of the Ngonyama Trust Land the site with more emphasis in terms of, uh, of why we feel that we may be money to do something as far as the management of those areas is concerned. And lastly, I'll also indicate our future plans, because of course, I don't think it's adequate for us to say we can plan for Ingonyama Trust. Jared is around highlighting that our aspiration, our aspiration as a team municipality, this is what we are intending to do. But of course, Ingonyama Trust Land and other stakeholders are the ones that have final say as far as that particular decision is concerned. But of course, as we, as we, since we are a government, we also have a, a legal obligation as far as the management of those areas, especially when it comes to environmental matters. But before I go to the question of, of Ngwenyama Trust, and I think it's very important for me to highlight some legislative and policy matters that might need to be taken into account when one is having this particular discussion. Uh, 
So I think that the first one is around recognizing that from 1992, we as, as, as a country, South Africa, we, we, we obligated, we, 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 we signed CPD. So basically we're binding ourselves to be uh, taking responsibility as far as the biodiversity elements of this country is concerned. That, is, that was in 1992. But as part of that, we are also committing ourselves to effective management of protected area. That, part, that was part of the package as far as EPC, uh, CPD is concerned. Then in, in 1996, when we had our first, like in fact, this, this was the second constitution because like the first one was an interim one of 1994. We, we even came up with the environmental sec, like sec, section, which is section 24. And the part last section is, is, is divided into two main components that are important. The first one is around acknowledging that everyone has a right to environment that is not harmful to their health and, and, and well-being. That's the first part. But then the second came, the second part is saying that that partla, like that, that partla right should also be protected by reasonable legislation and other means. I think when it comes to other means, that's where stewardship is coming to the part. Because we also, especially from stewardship side, we are also exploring other means of ensuring that it's this, this partnership for power of conservation between government and private landowners and including the communities as well. And section, uh, interestingly, when it comes to our constitution, when it comes to chapter two, it's specifically be dealing with the Bill of Rights. And the section that I've, 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 I've talked about, which is section 24, is specifically under section, uh, be the Bill of Rights. And section seven, is, all, is putting the obligation on the state when it comes to firstly respecting, protecting and promoting the, the, the chapter two or the bill of rights, including the environmental rights. So I think that, that is also very important to take into account when we're having this particular discussion. Because basically the, the, the constitution is not only saying that you should be protecting the, 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 the properties that are within our jurisdiction as far as environmental matters are, is concerned, but it's also putting us, is giving us an obligation as far as ensuring that we are also considering the environmental rights that are, are highlighted. And we also have an obligation of ensuring that they are also protected. And interestingly, after 1996, we uh, we uh, had the situation whereby in 1998 there was very like, uh, legislate there's, there's quite a number of legislation that we promulgated, uh, promulgated. One of them is National Environmental uh, Management Act of 1998, which is quite interesting because if you look at the PADLA legislation, especially when one is looking at Section Two. It, it comes up with different principles. And one of those principles is around ensuring that at least when it comes to us dealing with environmental matters, we should also take into account the, 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 the economic pillar and the social pillar. Although the challenge has always been around balancing these three pillars, but of course they, they, they are there in terms of the principles. And interestingly, in 19, 2003, in this country, we we're able to come up with the legislation, specifically Section 24 of the legislature of the National Environmental Management Protected Areas Act, Section 23 uh, and Section 28 has been making it e easier or possible for any private landowner or communities that feel that they have elements of biodiversity uh, importance in their properties to proclaim them uh, uh, as, uh, as, uh, as protected area. So that, that, that has also provided for that. Interestingly, in the same legislation, there's also a very clear uh, indication or commitment in terms of saying when it comes to these protected areas, we need to, to ensure that at least there are management plans. And even when it comes to the requirements for the management plans, they, they are there. So interestingly to me, that part of legislation is important because it also allowed 
it, especially when it comes to us, who, people who are interested in working even outside of state of state their own properties, to be able to use the provisions of that particular legislation to argue for uh, for 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 landowners and communities to work with the government in terms of protection of biodiversity. And in 2004, although I won't be able to go into details as far as issue of this. Uh, legislations are concerned. I'll only highlight the elements that I feel that they are important for our discussion. And there was also promulgation of the Biodiversity Act. I think what is also, there are two elements that I think to me that are important for this particular discussion. The first one is the fact that when it comes to this legislation, it, 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 there's, all, there's a prescription that the organs of state need to ensure that they are preparing the, 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 the plans for dealing with, in, with invested alien plants that are in their, in, their, in their properties. And the second one is also around the fact that that particular legislation, especially if it also provide, especially if you look at, I think it's section 44, it also provided for the Ministry of Environmental Affairs to be able to make enter into biodiversity management agreement with any individuals or organization for biodiversity, for, for protection of specific and, and management of specific biodiversity elements. And of course, in, two, in 2004, I think you should also, especially as a person who comes from biodiversity stewardship program, it's also important to note that the, the Western Cape province, they were able to come up with their own biodiversity stewardship program that enabled them to be able to facilitate the process of partnership between private and owners and, 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 and government for biodiversity protection. But of course, it was also making use of the Protected Areas Act, especially when it comes to proclamation of some of the areas that we were proclaiming as far as, far as the, the, the requirements of the of that legislation is concerned. Then in 2006, we as a KwaZulu Natal were able to come up with our own power of stewardship program, of course, learning from Western Cape. So that's why after that, there was a lot of cross coordination between these two provinces as far as the implementation of the power of stewardship program. And in 2008, we we're able to, as a country to come up with the National Protected Air Expansion Strategy. Uh, basically, we also put more emphasis in terms of the need for, for, the, for, for the government to, make, to enter into biodiversity management uh, partnership with, uh, with private landowners and communities. That was also around acknowledging that those private areas and the communal areas, especially those that are in rich in terms of biodiversity, they have a, they have a very important role to play in terms of, 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 bio, of protected area expansion. And in 2016, we as a Tewin inspired it, we also came up with our own Tewin biodiversity stewardship uh, coalition that also provided as a vacuum for us to enter into not only enter, but at the same time to facilitate for biodiversity stewardship, a partnership between us as government and, and private and communal uh, areas. So basically that's a framework, I think to me, that will, will be underpinning my input as far as today's discussion is concerned. But of course, the first question that I was asked was around explaining Ngoyama Trust. Although I just felt that I should also go beyond Ngoyama Trust and explaining Ngoyama and explaining Ngoyama Trust then, because basically um, I was doing that with an understanding when it comes to Ngoyama Trust then. It's not only about Ngoyama Trust, but there are also other stakeholders that are involved as far as the, 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 the particular piece of the, those particular pieces of land are concerned. So Ngoyama Trust. This partner, this partner entity was established in 1994 after the national party. And interestingly, this particular piece of legislation was passed the Ngonyama Trust Act, which provided for establishment of this Ngonyama Trust, was passed very, very few, few days before we had our first democratic election that took place on the 27th, April, 1994. 
Interestingly, this particular legislation was facilitated be, between IFP and during that particular time, the, the, the Mango Suchuk Teles was still part of the Guazulu government. So basically there was a facilitation of this particular discussion. So this particular uh, facilitation of the discussion around the, the promulgation of this particular legislation. I think there are two things that I, I think I need to pick to, to put your attention as far as this particular legislation is concerned. The first one, it provided for the what you called, because remember before during the apartheid regime, most of the KwaZulu land was under the administration of KwaZulu, of KwaZulu government. This was established in 19, I think in 1971, in 1971, under the, the, the Bantu homelands uh, constitution act that provided for the KwaZulu homeland to have its own executive power and legislative power. So basically, I think they were during that particular time when we were moving towards, it was very clear that we were moving towards the, the new dispensation. And I think there was also a concern, and I might be correct, I need to be corrected when it comes to this one. I think there was a concern, if I'm not making a mistake, that it, when the ANC government took over, it, the government will not take care of the, the king of the Zulu or the Ngonyam. And by the way, the, the name Ngonyam means the king, the king of the Zulu. So that's why I think there was this rush. So basically, this particular act is established, is, is pro, was providing for establishment of the Ngonyama Trust. So this particular Ngonyama Trust will be responsible for administration of this particular land that was basically involving different um, courses that were under the king. So each under each of the Ngosi was responsible for different traditional communities. So basically it provided for this part. And in terms of the wording of this particular act, I think it's very important to highlight it. It, it, it says that it is for the, 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 the Ngonyama Trust land is for the well-being and benefit of traditional communities. And those communities were, were, were listed. Then in, two, in 19, this was in 1994. And then in 1997, uh, 1997, the same legislation was amended to, uh, to provide for establishment of the Ngonyama Trust Board. When, they, when, they, 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 because when the trust was established in 1994, they, 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 the king of the Zulu or King's Valley team during that time was the sole tr trustee. So that's why in 1994, in 1997, through the national parliament, there was this part uh, Amendment that provided for Ingonyama transport to be to be uh, to to be uh, work to be assisting in terms of administration of the Ingonyama trust land. But of course, as I indicated before, it, the, 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 the Ingonyama Trust Act was very clear that the, the particular land, the Ingonyama Trust land, was for the benefit and well-being of different communities. And those communities, of course, were under tr different traditional authorities. And each of those traditional authorities were responsible for each of their respective traditional co yeah, the area, com communal area and, and all that. And interestingly, another development in terms of legislation, which to me is related to the second, to the another stakeholder that you need to take into account. Is the, is, the, is the national legislation, which is called the national, in fact, it's called the, the Traditional Leadership and Governance Framework Act of 2003. So that part of legislation, according to the writers of that part of legislation, which was part of, of, of democratizing the traditional leadership in traditional communities. So basically it's just written in such a way that it also provided for opportunities for communities. Because remember before it was a situation where by inclusive when it comes to advisors to just choose in terms of saying these are my advisors. So in 2003, at least that partner framework provided for a, or prescribed for for some of at least some of the members of the traditional council to be voted to be part so that at least there could be some kind of, of of representation but of course it still allowed 
for Inki Opos to recommend some of the people to be part, some of the people to be part of the traditional council. And interestingly, the Patla legislation, it also um, uh, prescribed some of the responsibilities of the traditional council members. One of the responsibilities to ensure that they, at least they are responsible for sustainable development in their respective communities. And in, in 2005, we were able to come up with our own as, as a province, KwaZulu Natal, like uh, 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 traditional leadership and governance act that was in 2005. Another uh, stakeholder that you also need to take into account in this space is also the white committees that are led by the, the council, my white council. I think this is also important because given that in, in the new dispensation, we have this wall to wall kind of municipality. So in every corner of our of this particular country, we will we, we'll find a white committee. So I think that's why I think it's even in traditional communities. So basically it's a situation whereby the, the traditional authorities are no longer operating on their own in terms of administration and government, but even the white committee, especially in, in, in the form of a white council, they are there. And another important one is this co community members. I think it's, um, the reason I'm highlighting that is because in most cases, there's this partner assumption that in most cases, when we, that when we work with communities, automatically, when, when, when we work with Induna or Amakos, automatically we are working with them, with, 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 uh, with community members. I think it's very important to regard them as, as, as much as they are clinked to the other stakeholders, but it's also very important to consider them as, a, as some kind of a, a, a layer that needs to be taken into account, especially when it comes to decision making. Because I know that in most cases, they despite the assumption that, we, that when one has spoken with the Ingozi, automatically the interest of Ingozi is representing the interest of all, all the ordinary community members in that particular respective community. But unfortunately, in my experience, it's not always the case. I think the, 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 the situation in terms of what is happening, in terms of mining operations that are challenged, by communities in, in areas like Fufu and all that to me is an indication that when it comes to our in, 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 in intervention, we need to take ordinary community members. But of course, I'm not assuming that even those these ordinary community members are homogeneous. They also have their own different interests and different agendas. And they also have different attachment with this particular border city feature that we are trying to protect. Another one, which is also part of this, is also government departments and civil society, especially when it comes to NGOs. And if the government, the government departments, the, the one that I think to me comes to my attention is the Department of, 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 of Rural Development and then Reform. Because in Gonyama Trust Land, it's in, in fact, it's in Gonyama Trust but is expected to report to them. In fact, they are expected to hold this partner in Gonyama Transport accountable. That's why in Gonyama Transport reports to them. But there's also another one, which is called the, the Portfolio Committee on Land Reform, Agriculture and Rural Development. This is also it has a, a, a role of overseeing the rule, the, the role of you know, in Gonyama Transport. Uh, another one that should, should also be taken into account is the private sector, because in most cases, like we just tend to overlook uh, or under, uh, yeah, like overlook the, the influence of, especially given that some of these over the private sector guys have so much money, which to me, they, they, they play a very important role in terms of tempting sometimes and sometimes finding a way of twisting the arms of some of the community leaders, especially sometimes using their financial muscle to push their, their own project. And some of those projects, unfortunately, they are not in line with the, with the ethos of biodiversity conservation. So basically, that's a picture that I presented about Ngonyama Trust Land. But of course, I think it's very important to, this picture is just showing how how this although I might be generalizing, but basically this is a, how some of these rural communities look like. 
And in terms of the communities that I was talking about, for instance, in terms of uh, tenure arrangement, you'd find that one household will be given a piece of land. So this is a situation here. Like you'll find that this particular household will be given, that is shown here, will be given a piece of land. And that particular household, as far as the tenure arrangement is concerned, will have a user, primary user rights, as far as that particular piece of land that will be allocated to them. And those, those rights are also, said, are also associated with residential rights and at the same time, the right to be able to cultivate with the, the, their area, the, the area that has been specifically allocated to them. So basically, those, those rights should be their primary right. But in addition to that, it's also important to note that they also have secondary rights as far as the communal area is concerned. For instance, they also have a right in terms of grazing some of these areas, and they also have rights in terms of uh, community plan collection, even in terms of using them, these areas for spiritual uh, uh, purpose. So wh whatever decision that you that are taken, decision that are taken in, in, in an ideal world, those decisions should also ensure that at least these households are also taken into account, especially given that they also have secondary rights. So another question that I was also asked was also around why are we paying so much attention? But I've already indicated that in terms of the Protected Areas Act, there's also acknowledgement that at least we, we need to, there's also a provision for some of these communities to be able to proclaim some of these, their areas as, as, as protected areas. But of course, even in terms of protected area expansion, there's also acknowledgement that when it comes to us, we were achieving our target as far as protect about of its conservation is, is concerned. We can no longer rely on bio on, on land acquisition and more and proclaiming only the land that is in the hands of the state. So that's why we need to look at the, the land that is occupied by even when the private landowners, even the Ngonyama Trust Land as well. And the question is why Ngonyama Trust Land? The reason Ngonyama Trust Land is also is taken, especially in the context of Natal, Natal, maybe that should be my starting point. About 30% of Kwazulu Natal falls under Ngonyama Trust. So it is very important to consider Ngonyama Trust as, as a very important influential land on as far as it just if the province is concerned. But as far as the Tewin is concerned, we are a, a Tewin area is concerned, for, about 44% of the Tewin municipal area falls under Ngonyama Trust. But of course, in addition to that, there are all, quite a number of a, a different environmental assets that are found in this particular area. And that has also been demonstrated by, and by the, the fact that he, he demo, the demos, uh, our demos is also pointing to that direction. But of course, there's quite a number of threats that we, one that has to deal with as far as Ngoyama Trust. And for instance, the key one, especially when we're looking at some of the areas like what the Kuimba and Ilovu area is sand mining which is quite a serious one. There's also another challenge as far as the, like, yeah, uh, invasive alien and uh, uncontrolled arson fires, especially on grasslands. So there's a need for us to really to consider not only because we are interested in, 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 in securing those particular piece of land, but it's also around saying that we, we can no longer afford to, to overlook those challenges that are happening, especially those issues that I've mentioned in terms of sand mining and investigating. But of course, in terms of demos, most of these of our demos, of course, my in my, my my colleague Kemp, who's also responsible for mapping demos and all that, is is can yeah can attest this. Most of those areas are in Go are in Goyama Trust land. Maybe it's because of the of, of, of the historical fact that in most cases, when it comes to apartheid uh, like administrators, when it comes to develop op opportunities. I don't think, especially within a Tewini, I don't think the, the opportunities were the same in terms of the what we call former 
uh, Guazulu homeland. So there were so many opportunities in, in areas that were outside, which to me has also put most of these communities in, in a better position as far as ownership of, of this environment, like being in position of these biodiversity elements that you are talking about. So that's why in my understanding, when it comes to this part of work that you are doing, especially when it comes to working with traditional communities in Goyama Trust Land, it should not only about ourselves and science in terms of saying these are the key issues that you like to address, but it should also be a, a, the story of affirmation to say, guys, we really appreciate the fact that you have been able to keep this na na natural asset in this particular state. Although some of them have challenges, but I think to me, as I indicated, most of these areas that you are in, into protecting are in the, still in the hands of Ingonyama trust land stakeholders. And unfortunately, when it comes to it the most, I'm not sure whether it is clear because the, the green the green patches should be indicating the, the areas that are under that are, are still better under the most. And the white patches are indicating the areas that are outside of the most. And especially if you one is looking, I'm not sure if you can see Toyana. You can see how much of the of the green areas are on that part like, like traditional community there. And there's, there's, there are so many opportunities, even when it comes to Ama Pepeta, although they, there's quite a high level of fragmentation in some of these areas. But of course, like you, you can see that there are so many opportunities that, we, we, that one might need to look at in terms of uh, biodiversity conservation. And I was also given a task of showing where these particular areas are, especially in terms of the sites that you are talking about in terms of stewardship. And I'm not sure if you can see this is N2, in fact, this is N3, and this is N2, and sorry. And this is the uh, Umgeni River. And interestingly, from 2000 and, 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 and from 2013, it's a wind municipality has also been part of the Umgeni Ecological Infrastructure Pro, uh, Pro, uh, Partnership. So basically, it is also looking at the whole cash demand, including the areas that are outside of it's a wind municipality. So basically, this is Umgeni River. And Umjoti, and yeah, like there's also Umlazi River, I'm not sure if you can see it, and there's also Zimbabwe River and further south you can see Ilovo River, and the red areas is the, are the sites that you are interested in. As you can see, most of the sites that we have targeted, firstly, you can see that they are also part of the very important river as far as the the, the, the catchment is concerned. And interestingly, I think it's also not mentioning that when remember i mentioned that in 2008 we were able to get, to come up with a protected national protected area expansion strategy and when it was reviewed in 2016 there was acknowledgement that most of our work when it comes to protected area expansion were more biased towards terrestrial areas, but we are not paying attention to eco, uh, aquatic ecosystem. So to me, although it's, it's quite difficult to protect rivers, but those are some, some of the areas that one man need to look at, especially looking at how these areas can be incorporated in terms of, of, of the size that we are working with. And yeah, but uh, they are also indicated, especially when it comes to Umgeni River, I also indicated some of the areas that are not necessarily stewardship sites, but to show that the stewardship site that you are looking at, they are not only there in isolation, they are, but they are also part and parcel of, conserve, of part of its conservation in a broader scheme of things. For instance, I'm not sure if you can see, if you, like, especially next to Nagel Dam, there's a big piece of yellow patch uh, this one, this patch is, although it's, it falls under outside of a municipality, it's under, it's owned by the Gumisa well, traditional community. 
So they've already started the process of being part of the stewardship program, although they are outside of, 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 of us as a table news party. And of course, we also have this area that is falling under in Gosukwala called Amapepete. I'm not sure if you can see my arrow here. We also have an interest as far as this particular area is concerned. And linked to that, there's also another one which is called Inanda Mountain, which is about, uh, I think if I'm not making a mistake, it's more than 200 hectares of KZ and sandstone south of grassland. And, and along, um, along um, the river, few kilometers, uh, few kilometers before you reach as a mere dam, you can see this, oh, there's also another area called Eguazini. And part of the, uh, uh, one section of that area is under us as a Tewini, and another section is falling under in, into it, the local municipality or um, Ilembe district municipality. As, if, as you can see, that in terms of uh, uh, the, the location of the Spatla site, management of the site is, is, is very important, as for, especially as far as protection of water that enters as a mere dam. I think the same thing has also been said about Kwaklimba as well, because Kwaklimba is here, and which is very, to a few kilometers from Kato Ridge. And it's quite important as far as like Kwaklimba and Mapet Peter, they are quite important as far as Umgeni catchment is concerned. And as far as Gua Klimba is concerned, it's also important to note that I'm not sure if you can see, you can see my arrow. Like that particular piece, those pieces of land are under us as a Chiguin municipality. They are called Motis C. So currently we are in the process of, 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 of proclaiming it uh, as, as, a nature, as, as a nature reserve, but we are, yeah, it's still under pros, process. And there's also Pezulu uh, game estate. I'm not sure if you can see it in, uh, I'm, not, I'm not good with colors, but I think it's spirit or purple, yeah, something like that. And outside, of course, the yeah, outside of like, I think after just a few kilometers from uh, Kato Ridge, there's also another a uh, like a piece of uh, of land. Although it's although it's outside of Etienne Williams Pile, it is called Maibuye. It, this one is a, a game reserve in Maibuye uh, game reserve. It's under a community. It was given to communities through land land, land reform process, uh, restitution process to be to be specific. And this is the Buffett's Dry. I think most of you are familiar with Buffett's Dry. And which is next to Verulam is under Itaewin municipality, is not part of Chuachi, but of course, it's, it's, it's few kilometers from uh, the Chuachi site that we are looking at. Uh, further south, is, especially, we, we also have uh, Chongweni game, re uh, game reserve. When it comes to this one, this is not a, a, as much as it is a stewardship site, but it is not a um, in Gonyama Trust land. This one is under community trust. It was given to the community through this restitution process. But we also have an interest as far as this one is concerned. And there's also another one called, next to it, there's also another one called Duffel Corp. It, it, this one is also very nice because it also has nice, uh, so, um, Kaza okay, then some so, uh, so, south 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 grassland and some patches of eastern scarf forest, and further south uh, and along the uh, river, there's also another site called the uh, Wakale, which is under Ingosi Kale. And further south, there's also another one called Toyana is under under what one what what which was transferred to us as a Tewini after 2016 local government election. So it's quite a new site and of course it also has a potential in terms of biodiversity. But interestingly is one of those areas that are still natural and there are so many opportunities in terms of working there. And maybe it's because of the lack of the fact that we have We've always been told by the community that when the, the community used to be under Oku district, there were very limited uh, development opportunities. But I'm not sure that like, even that they will, it should be transferred, like it has been transferred to us, 
and how will those development opportunities negatively impact on biodiversity elements of the Cutler area? That's why it's very important for us to start looking at formalizing, at least starting engaging the communities, looking at the whole question of partnering with the, with the communities. So basically, this is how this site look like. As, okay, as I indicated before, this is Montesim, this is Pezu, this is Guacrimba. Yeah, and another thing that I might also need to put to your attention, when it comes to these patches, the red patches that I've indicated, like here on these maps, uh, these are representing only the natural areas. So we have tribal means to remove the transformed areas or the modified areas. Most of these areas that I've indicated here are uh, natural areas that will be excluding like rivers or other infrastructure, like not, not rivers, households, like, uh, like uh, schools and other infrastructure. So those are re representing the, the natural areas. So basically this, this is one of the picture of Kwakrimba, which is as I indicated to you, this is, yeah, this is also one of the stewardship sites. And this is further down, we also have Shongweni, as I also, Shongweni Game Reserve. As I indicated, we have Daffel Corp, and further, like, yeah, on, on, your right, on, on my right, there's also Silver Claim, which is, many, which is managed by NRP. So this is a picture that was taken in Daffel Corp, showing the uh, scarf forest and uh, in terms of the habitat. And of course, yeah, it's quite a nice area. And this is quite clearly that I've also shown you, as you can see, it also is this part like has a dense on uh, south of grassland. This is Choyana. This is just a closer uh, uh, look. And of course, for, for now, we are only focusing on Choyana, but of course, there are so many other opportunities because there's also another area that's on this particular side that is old now it's still very natural it's owned by imposing kids so there are also opportunities of looking at other areas that are also neighboring this one so this one was taken in in, in Toyana. this picture was taken this is the love river so it, it, there's also a question around management on whether the, the sites are managed. It's, it's, it's so difficult because currently, like, I don't think we have an objective assessment because I know that in terms of protected areas, they, they've been, been able to develop uh, the what we call management effectiveness tracking tool. That, it, that makes it easy for one to tell in terms of where as far as management is concerned. But uh, based on my experience working in terms of working in these areas, as much as there are different projects that are implemented there, but you'll find that the, like, uh, those are just projects in most cases. You'll find that there's no, there's no evidence that the uh, management and legal tools that are uh, used in those particular areas. For instance, when it comes to fire, I'll just give an example. You'll find that most of the fires that are happening in some most of these grasslands, uh, they are not really planned in my experience. We find that someone would just wake up in the morning and feel that, no, I'm in a mood for burning something and they'll just burn the grass. And sometimes we find that some of these fires are, will be started by hunters because they are trying to trigger the, 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 with the green flash. And sometimes they uh, start. They will be started by a livestock owner, like livestock grazers and all that. But yeah, there are no systems that I know of. But at the same time, to complicate matters, the fact that even the government has not been assisting in most cases, assisting the situation, because we find that even when it comes to government interventions that are taking place in most of these areas, they are not properly aligned. So we'll find that in most cases, you, you might have two or three government departments working in, in the same space. They are not even talking to each other. And sometimes they might even be sending conflicting messages to the community. And sometimes there could also be some kind of, uh, of, 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 of some kind of, uh, of, of duplication in terms of the, the interventions that are, that are happening there. 
Of course, that they, you'll find that is especially when it comes to the issue that uh, I mentioned, especially when it comes to uh, uh, in fires and send mining, you find that there are no clear mechanisms in most cases. And unfortunately, we as government, when it comes to these matters, we have always been found with, uh, yeah, like wanting. So like uh, send mining is just a typical example of how well, we've, like, yeah, we have been doing in terms of not uh, being proactive in terms of dealing with these issues. Uh, another one is also related to allocative efficiency. You'll find it in most cases, as much as with the science, especially when it comes to systematic conservation planning, I think we've been able to, uh, to come up with tools that will allow us to say, at least ideally, this is where the biodiversity elements should be. And in fact, even in terms of resource allocation, that science should be able to direct us in terms of saying, when you're assisting the communities, these the communities, these are the communities that should be uh, supported. And to make it worse, sometimes we'll find that there are situations whereby uh, some of the then owners that are not necessarily pro conservation, especially when come to communities, are getting all the support, but the communities that are pro conservation are not getting enough attention. So, basically, in a nutshell, I don't think there's been consistency of you in terms of use of the government using carrot and stick. And the last one is also related to the fact that even the partnership between government and communities is, is, is not that like it is not the partnership is not properly defined. As I indicated in 2006 in this partner province, where we've been able to come up with our own uh, biodiversity stewardship, which to me provide tools for proper definition. And of, of, of relationship between government and communities, even when it comes to landowners. But I'm not, I'm not convinced that we've done enough in terms of making those partner tools. Mm -hmm. So on those lines, I'm trying to communicate that I'm not convinced that we have enough elements that will constitute a, like a, as like that will that will be crucial as far as far as properly managed sites sites are, are concerned. So the, the, the last question is, is related to, which to me is also related to the question of why this partner discussion is important. This, this discussion of today's con is, is important. So the, the future plans, I think what is more important as far as the future the plan, the planned future of the Ngonyama Trust is concerned, is we just need to ensure that at least we get it right in terms of biodiversity assessment. Because as much as we have, we do have information, especially when it comes to some of the areas, but I think it's very limited. That's why I think it's very important for us to ensure that yeah, we have detailed assessment, especially when it comes to ensuring that we have enough information about species. Because in my experience, most scientists they have been like, yeah, been shying away in terms of visiting some of these areas. But of course, maybe because of their own reasons. But I think it, it might also count the, the fact that most of these areas used to be under uh, Wazulu homelands, which was not in most cases regarded as part of, 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 of a bigger uh, picture, especially as, if, as the country is concerned. It also played a, a, a role in terms of that. So basically, I think to me, we need information about these areas, especially when it comes to uh, species. And at the same time, there's also a need for information as far as ecosystems is concerned, especially when it comes to the condition of this assessment. So I think that's where the, the expertise of you as researchers is, 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 is important. So of course, after that, we'll be able to use those particular results of the assessment to, as part of negotiating especially with the province, case I didn't write in, in particular, because in most cases, when you come to, especially when you come to the stewardship site processes, we need to ensure that we are working with KZN and WATLAF, especially in terms of, because they are the ones that will be able to advise us in terms of saying, which of these areas will qualify 
as a nature reserve and which ones would qualify uh, for other categories as far as different categories are concerned. Of course, the, this part of information is not only important for, for us and traditional communities, it's also important for KZN Wattlaff, but so it's also in the best interest for KZN Wattlaff to have a picture in terms of, of the distribution of different species in the province. So this pipeline information will not only be helping in this decision making, but it's still also important for, 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 the, for the whole province as well, especially as far as KZN Wattlaff's work is concerned. But of course, we'll also be using the information to be able to define the relationship between us, like especially as government and, community, and communities in relation to the site. That is also a very important because it will also allow us to be able to say these are the sensitive sites and these are the sensitive, these are the species that might need to, to be taken into account when it comes to you grazing, and, for instance, when even when it comes to burning and all that. So in a way, you'll also have an input. This information will also have an input as far as management of the site is concerned. Of course, like even when it comes to management, especially when it comes to management plan, that, that, that information from scientists is very important. So that's why we will also be looking at that in terms of how can we make use of this information for management plans and especially for decision making within the framework of, of the management plan. And the last one is also around you know, like continuing with the process of lobbying for, for, for support for the sites. Because I think to me, as it has always been uh, highlighted, in Gonyama Trust Land is such an important piece of the, of the jigsaw puzzle as far as the, the I mean, as far as conservation of the integrity municipality areas biodiversity. So we can't afford really to have these sites not getting enough support. So to me, the more information we have about this site, the more it, it will be easier for us to lobby. But of course, I'm saying that with an understanding that that call in terms of this partnership, it should not only about us as government, but of course, if in, in Goyama Trust and, and the communities and the traditional councils as well, need to ensure that this should be a two-way street that should also come to the party, but not only as the recipients of what, of, 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 of what we are talking about, but of course, as, as, as active uh, uh, stakeholders in terms of ensuring that the power of its elements of these sites are, are, are protected, not only for the citizens of the Etegui municipal area, but of course for the traditional communities, given that most of these power of its elements that you are talking about are so crucial as far as the livelihoods of traditional communities are concerned. Thank you very much. Thank you, Becca, for that. Um, yeah, to to condense all of um, all of the complexity into something, you know, that just getting to the point of what what it is that, well, the reason why we're having the seminar to to sort of discuss ideas around how do we get these detailed biodiversity assessments. Um, we had tried to do um, sort of biodiversity surveys. And unfortunately, it fell into that same week that we went into the first COVID lockdown. So there was a bit of um, confusion there and we weren't able to, to get uh, some of our um, experts who volunteered to get out uh, into one of the areas and just assess and see and maybe come up with a plan of how they could sample the area and provide um, a, a species list at least. Um, so let's just open up for, for questions. So if you have anything any questions for Becca, um, please put your hand up uh, and yeah, and we can just uh, start this discussion. Okay, Natalie um, has posted a question in the chat box. Um, oh, I see there's, there's also, Juliet has posted, let's go with that. Um, uh, Becca, you mentioned um, have some you have some existing information do you have a list of existing references and reports uh, 
Uh, yeah, thanks, Presh. Can you be specific? What kind of information will you be looking at? Uh, I'm not too sure. Maybe Juliet can uh, can elaborate a little bit um, uh, okay. of what she's of what she's asking. Uh, I think she's just asking what sort of existing information do you already have? Um, oh, just any general information. So, um, yeah, uh, are there existing references and reports for some of these areas, or is it really that it's a completely blank slate? I suppose. Yeah, I mean, for instance, like uh, Dr. Kamani has already done some work. For instance, she had a student working or, uh, on the Wakale uh, site in terms of doing, doing the fail condition assessment. So the report was also made available to us. And we also had one student doing the mapping exercise for uh, eucalyptus at uh, Toyana as well. And you also had, you remember, you, know, already, you remember last year, as you have already indicated, Prashni, we visited, we were planning to do a, a, a bio blitz, but because of like, yeah, I think people were, there, there was this part of confusion on whether we should proceed or we ended up, like some of us, like we were not able to be part of, of that part of bio blitz, but the entomologist by the name of Mark was able to visit Kwakrel um, uh, and he was able to produce some, to give us a list of, of I think, more than 30 butterflies species, yeah. So there, there, is, there is information that is available. And I, I think it's also part of, of this to, to, today's discussion, even to have an understanding in terms of who has done what, because at the same time, we don't want to reinvent the wheel. If someone has done the research in terms of in, 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 this, in this, these areas, we will really love to have an access to, to that information. But of course, I can make some, from some of the information that is available. I can share it with you, Krishni, then you can share it with everyone. And at the same time, I, 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 maybe I might also need to, to highlight that maybe after, after this, because today it was mainly around showing everyone where these sites are. I hope in future we'll be able to deal with the specific site to say, okay, quite clearly, let's just look at quite clearly and let us check what information is already in existence as far as this particular site. I'm sure in future we'll be able to have a specific uh, discussion for specific sites. Yeah, I think we just need to work around um, looking at what's already there and then uh, trying to fill the gaps as we go. Um, so, Peter, um, we'll just go over to you. You have your hand up and then we'll go to uh, Natalie's question. Um, and then there's also thanks, another uh, question in the chat box. Yes, go ahead. Yeah, thanks, Prisha, and uh, good morning to colleagues. Um, I'm from Etiquini um, Economic Development Unit. Um, some years back, uh, we, as a Tequeni, piloted the Rural Area Based Management Program, um, uh, which obviously focused purely on the rural uh, tribal areas of Tequeni. And I recall our colleagues from, from our environmental branch, we mapped uh, strategic environmental areas uh, with the view of trying to set up uh, community or biodiversity stewardship programs. Uh, to try and secure these areas. I don't know if that information is, is still available. Um, but the, the success of trying to set up these areas and manage them was basically boiled down to what benefits were there for the communities um, to participate in setting aside these areas. So there was always an economic uh, benefit being looked at um in these areas um and one way of of looking at it is to tie these areas maybe to particular economic project areas and in particular tourism projects uh and we have a, quite a few of those uh in existence and proposed throughout the rural areas uh where you could have a tourism project linked to one of these areas that could potentially then feed off each other uh, and I'm talking of areas like, um, I see our colleagues from KZN Tourism uh, are proposing projects on top of uh, Inanda Mountain. Uh, there is uh, in Tatakusa at Armstrong Hill, another example. Um, we've also looked at tourism initiatives around Hazelmere Dam, Inanda Dam. 
uh, and even Shongweni Dam, uh, where obviously these projects are trying to be set up for uh, economic benefits to the communities. Uh, and many of these projects do fall within some of these areas that you are proposing um, on these maps that you've presented. So there's maybe opportunities there to form synergies, you know, that, uh, that one can work together, you know, in setting up these economic projects linked to some of these um, conservation areas uh, that you're trying to, uh, trying to protect. Um, so yeah, so I just want to raise a point that, you know, that that's one way of looking at this to link it to some form of economic uh, intervention that uh, together, you know, you can then create these benefits uh, to some of the host communities. Thanks. Oh, thanks for that, uh, Peter. Uh, Becca, do you want to comment? Yeah, thanks a lot, Peter. This is really highly appreciated because to me, that's exactly what we we looking we are looking forward to. Because basically, our department is very strong when it comes to environmental issues. But when it comes to, it goes back to the whole question of balancing the economic pillar and the environmental pillar. And if we can really partner with you, especially given your experience, we'll really appreciate, appreciate it. And it also, to me, those initiatives also allow us to be more proactive. Because if you are saying we are against transformation of land and modification of land, we should be able to provide sustainable alternatives on the table. I think people like you will really assist us in terms of achieving that. Yeah, I'm, look, I'm, I'm looking forward for more detailed discussion in terms of how we can go about in ensuring that, that that is happening. Thank you very much. Okay, um, let's go to um, uh, Natalie's question um, of the priority sites in Etiquini and, I, and on ITD land. What percentage of these have biodiversity stewardship agreements in place? And to what extent is there compliance monitoring when the MOUs are in place? Um, illegal sand mining is a pervasive issue. Um, what is being done to address this? So, so it's a bit of uh, two parts. So it's just basically um, what sort of are there um, in agreements in place and is there monitoring um, for the management of these, of these uh, biodiversity stewardship areas? And then the second one is um, what's being done to address the illegal sand mining. Yeah, I think when it comes to the question of whether we have finalized any agreement, we haven't finalized any agreement. This is part of, of, of the process of ensuring that at least, remember before you sign any agreement, you need to know exactly what is there. That's why partnering with, with researchers is important because the starting point should be around knowing what is there. And at the same time, then those, those partners, uh, that partner input will also help us in terms of the Shuachi process when we present to KZN Wildlife in particular to be able to say, this is what is on this partner site. For instance, if there's the evidence that some of these sites have like critical endangered species, that will straighten our case for, uh, by, for, protected, uh, for, for, for protective areas to be proclaimed. But of course, it's also, there's also another dimension, which is, which, which is related to what Peter has pointed out, to the, the, the government putting money where mouth is, because it's not enough to say these sites are important for biodiversity conservation, but we need to be able to, uh, as Peter has pointed out, provide alternatives in terms of some, this is what you are putting on the table as far as ecotourism is concerned, and this is how it's gonna benefit you. Because otherwise, if we are just saying we'll be proclaiming or signing any disagreements without alternate, like at least putting viable alternative, especially as far as economic benefits to the community, it will be it will just be used as a, a, a futile exercise, in my understanding. My my take is let us get it right as far as biodiversity elements are concerned, and in 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 addition to that. Let us put our the resources in terms of, but I'm not, I'm not saying we should be throwing resources, but at least in, 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 in principle, we should be able to say, if the communities are green on this part of stewardship uh, arrangement, this is what we can do as government in terms of assisting them. Thank you. Um, yeah, and I think this with the uh, illegal, 
send mining yes, issue. Yes, yeah, there's also yes. another question around send send mining. I'm not sure if I because you know in our department we also have like my colleague from environment like from compliance. I'm not sure if they are part of this meeting, but of course they will comment if they are available. But I, I think the challenges that we have also been facing, especially when it comes to dealing with sand mining, is the fact that when it comes to sand mining, it, it does not fall directly on our mandate. I think there's a problem when it comes to, like, or it may, I'll just say it's a challenge as far as environmental legislation is concerned. There, there are people that are, like, there are officials that are mandated for different pieces of legislation. So when it comes to uh, send mining, that's more of, of the MRs and mandate. But of course, from my colleagues, from uh, enforcement, if they are available, they can also, they can also add. I think that's, but in my, in my understanding, that's what we have been uh, struggling with. But of course, we have been, especially my colleagues have been doing a great job in terms of ensuring that they are inviting DMR to address some of these issues of sand mining. But from us as a table municipal, like, as, uh, from stewardship, especially working with the likes of Zoda Mungubeni, my colleague and others, we have also been able to proactively invite DMR to address some of the community members in workshops, especially I remember with some workshops on sand mining in Guaclimba, we also had another one in Mapepete, and also had another one in, in Guacale. But unfortunately, uh, doing workshops is not enough. It's also very important for the state to start uh, taking some action. As I indicated, the, when it comes to Section 7 of 7.2 of our constitution, we, the state also has a responsibility of ensuring that at least these environmental rights are protected. I think to me, it's nice to have these environmental workshops and awareness, but I think the state, the state should also be seen as active in terms of taking action. But of course, my colleagues from uh, that deals with environmental compliance will also add if I omitted anything. Thank you. Thanks, Becca. Um, so uh, Terry Stewart, uh, I think, uh, just gave a comment on, I think, uh, just understanding the compliance and um, uh, Natalie's question a little bit about uh, agreements in place. Uh, so he says, uh, um, ITB is not the landowner. They are essentially a giant body corporate. Uh, the question, though, is not whether or not they have a biodiversity policy, but why don't we see any formal acknowledgement of their legal responsibility to manage the land and uh, biodiversity compliance and compliance um, with our town planning schemes? This is the starting point at which uh, we should be coming up, uh, coming in to assist with partnerships. I think that's a, that's a very good point um, there. Uh, let's just go back to the questions. So, and Tom Bifuti uh, gave a question, uh, does the ITB as an entity have a policy on biodiversity protection? Or oh, I think that um, that also, uh, um, Terry's uh, comment also sort of uh, answers that question. Um, let's just go to Yvette's question here. In terms of land management, Becca mentioned that there are no clear mechanisms for dealing with environmental issues. Uh, my question is, how is land use planning dealt with? Um, the caveat is uh, in relation to development of land. The research uh, can be done to assess on the ground biodiversity, but how do we know what the land has been set aside for? No, I, yeah, if I could just comment there, I'm, I think this one is related to introduction of scheme, if I'm not making a mistake, in terms of, is it related to that, the question? Uh, I'm not sure, maybe. Um, yeah, maybe you she might need to explain. Yeah, because I know that in terms of pluma, although I'm, I'm, not, I'm not, I don't read it, I don't deal with that partner directly with that partner piece of legislation, but I know that there's been some processes specifically for trying to introduce some schemes in traditional communities, but I'm not sure where that particular process is. Maybe if my colleagues at this time who are planners would be able to advise us. Thank you. Um, Peter, you have your hand up. Uh, thanks, Yaf. I can maybe respond to that. Uh, yes, please. My involved. Yeah. Um, 
my understanding is that Etiquini now does have a wall to wall uh, scheme. Uh, I think all municipalities now have wall to wall schemes as of July or June last year. Uh, and this was uh, coordinated by, by Kochta. Um, my understanding that there's a blanket zoning now, they call it traditional authority area zone that's applied to all the tribal areas. Um, you know, obviously the primary land use there is typically would be agriculture, you know, a dwelling house, uh, municipal um, facilities. And then the rest is all allowed by special consent. Um, I don't think they have specifically zoned conservation areas. Uh, I could be wrong. Um, uh, although most of that is defined in the various spatial plans that have been done. Um, throughout the Etiquini area. Um, and obviously those plans, uh, the conservation areas would tie up with, with all the DEMOS areas that were um, identified. But I don't think they've been specifically zoned. Um, so I think this traditional authority blanket zoning was just a first step towards getting a scheme in place, you know, for the entire tribal areas. And then over time, um, start defining uh, specific zones. But then again, it's quite difficult because we don't have cadastral properties, you know, in tribal areas, you know. Um, so it's difficult to uh, define specific zonings because you don't have cadastral boundaries that would define where that zoning ends and starts. Um, so that may, does make it also difficult. Um, but there is a process that they is currently working towards um, having a separate scheme, you know, dealing with the, the tribal areas. Thanks. Uh, thanks for that, Peter. Um, yeah, so if it was just uh, asking basically how is the land carved up and who decides what happens to the land. So I think um, Peter's comment there, uh, I'm, not, I'm not sure if that if that answers the question a little bit. And then you, um, Peter also sent a comment uh, for the sustainable management and protection of bees. Um, uh, conservation areas it could potentially be linked with a tourism project uh, and community project to ensure economic ben uh, beneficiation to host communities uh, one option is to involve the owners operators of such tourism assets in the management uh, of the conservation areas or at least contribute towards it for example if a tourism uh, asset is built and leased out uh, to a private operator it could be done on a conditional agreement that the surrounding conservation areas are managed as a, as part of the tourist asset. Um, we've got a question or a comment here from Nakwanda. Etiquini has a DMOS layer and environmental conservation reserves in line with the schemes which contribute to the protection of ecologically sensitive areas. So my understanding here is that there is an overall idea um, for for what happens um, and how the land is is, is sort of managed or um, carved up, basically how what uh, that Etiquini would decide what happens with the land in essence. Um, if it says the cadastral point is a is a good example of the start of uh, LU planning, is, is that right? My worry is rural ex-urban sprawl as land becomes carved up. Oh, sorry, land use. Is there anyone um, else who has any questions specifically for Becca or um, any other questions on perhaps on the ITB areas in specifically. Okay, I don't really see um, any hands up. Um, Becca, I think uh, uh, just a question from, from my side. I know one of the key issues that we've come across with, um, uh, with, with trying to get researchers out uh, into the field has been uh, or into these areas has been um, logistics. So it's very difficult to access some of these areas. And um, one key issue has always been safety. So I think if you could just uh, speak a little bit about um, access to these areas and uh, permissions, perhaps, like how do people go about, like if they do want to do, let's say a project or 
do a survey in these areas? How do they go about contacting the relevant people so that they can get permission to to do um, to do work on these on in these sites? Yeah, I think for now, thanks, 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 Prashni. I think for now, we we can, we can you can use my department, especially with me, so and I, because we have been working in that space for quite some time. So we, I think we can be in the link between the researchers and these traditional communities. But I, I would also stress that it's also very important for researchers to give us more time when it comes to, because they have they been a situation where by a person will just give me a call and say, Pega, um, we are planning to go to the site tomorrow. Can you join us? Which to me, from processes perspective, I don't think it's reasonable because firstly, as part of the process, we need to ensure that we are, form, we are, for, we are informing, the Indu, informing the Induna so that at least the Induna can make at least Firstly, allow you to have an access to that particular piece of land, and secondly, for them to understand what that particular research is all about, and thirdly, for them to be able to even to organize someone to go with you when it comes to you wanting to do field work and all that for safety reasons. Because I know that it's not safe for one in any even when even when, when it comes to our nature reserve to for one to move around carrying expensive camera or research equipment is always useful to get someone, a local person, to be there with you. Thank you. Uh, yeah, thanks for that. That just to give uh, some perspective. Um, uh, Lee says um, information regarding uh, obtaining signed land owner and land uh, manager permission or authorization is key. Yeah, for a lot of that we do, um, and also for our ethics and uh, thing. We, we do need permission um, when, when doing work. Uh, yeah, and sometimes formal permission as well. And then what provisions, uh, she just asked a question here, what provisions are made for field-based research uh, taking place at night? So that's a good question. So if they were going to be, um, you know, sort of uh, nocturnal surveys and stuff, what, uh, what sort of uh, provisions can be made for, in terms of for ensuring safety? Yeah, I think to me, you, you you make the same, maybe I might need to go back a little bit to say, I think to me, researchers also have a responsibility as far as I know, of ensuring that whatever research that is taking place, it also triggers the interest of the community. So in my understanding, it's always useful to at least, if, even if you know that community members are not necessarily researchers, to ensure that at least we have some people that are at least are informed about what your research is all about and try by all means to ensure that at least you you work with them because I'm, I can assure there will be people who will be willing to go an extra mile in terms of assisting you even at night to ensure that at least your, your research is, 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 is successful. I know that it has been done in some of in some of the sites, even outside of the Tenguinus Palace, where ordinary community members just become some kind of, of, of key actors as far as this, the research is concerned. And at the same time, I think to me, it also allows, it also provides an opportunity for the researchers as well to learn from the community. Because I think there's so much local knowledge that is there. We might know some of the staff as like scientists and all that, but at the same time, it depends on how we do our research. I think there's also an opportunity of, of learning from local knowledge as well. I'll, I'll just give an example. Although this particular example is not directly related to, to this discussion, I'm not sure if it's part of this discussion. We're in Howick. And we're trying to we're trying by all means try to try earthworms to find earthworms for so for, for 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 fishing. We're struggling. And after about 20 minutes, a young person, a very young person from the area said, guys, what are you said to, to us? What are you doing? He said, he said, no, we're looking for earthworms. Within seconds, the young man was able to show us where the earthworms were. So, which to me shows how, how crucial local knowledge is. So I think to me, it's in the best interest to ensure that at least, yeah, the, no, the, 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 the communities are there. That's a, that's a very good point. Um, yeah, you know, this, it, just, it just does help to, like the local people would know the area best and can really like help you. 
Um, so I think yeah, there needs to be that sort of two way sharing. Um, and, you know, maybe, you know, I think I think it's a good engagement if we can if we can try to promote that um, and get people involved so they'll have like an investment in, you know, uh, in the research. And um, yeah, so uh, Juliet asks if uh, we want to plan field work, how much notice would you need Becca or Smiso, I suppose, or whoever we get in contact with in, in Etiquini? How much uh, notice would you need on average to get in contact with local landowners and community members and to get consent? Um, yeah, uh, uh, I'm not sure. I'm, I mean, I'm assuming if maybe a week or two in advance, something that just I'm sure you have to, it depends also, I suppose, on the research, um, if you have to have discussions or explain things or, um, yeah, just let us know how 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 much time would you need? Yeah, thanks a lot, Presley. I think two, two weeks or one week is enough. But of, of course, I think we, what you, I, I think we've already pointed it to an hour. Even uh, to me, it's also very important for us to have a summary that you can communicate to communities to say, this is my research uh, all about, and this is how we think it will be of assistance to, to the community as well. I think it makes it easier for me when I'm communicating the research project to the traditional community to say, this is what the researcher is planning to do. and. This is how we feel it will be of significance to, to the community. But of course, I'm saying that with, with an understanding that is not all the research project project that will be having a direct uh, like uh, uh, relevance to communities. But I think in the long run, Prashni, it's also very important for, for the research institution to look at how they can also have some kind of a partnership with communities at, at, at local community level, at, at community level. Because just imagine if they know, for instance, in Guaycay, that there's UKZN. I'm just giving an example, like research, like their like the, 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 the research from, like, from, from UKZN. Once you establish that partner relationship, it makes it easy for other researchers, especially when it comes to uh, masters and, and my honor students, that you find that maybe in terms of their research, they have a very limited time in terms of stuff. So these bridges are very important because it makes easier for other researchers as well to to, 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 to be able to be accepted by the community. I'll just give an example. At some stage when I was still working in the province, uh, UKZN had a partnership with the, with, um, with the Mbongolwan um, through Donovan Kotze, of course. Dr. Donovan Kotze with Mbongolwan community next to Shore. So the partner link connection between Donovan Kotze and Ingozi and Ingozi to Nduli, it makes it it made it easier for other researchers to be accepted with with with, with limited uh, or like yeah, resistance from the community because already Donovan Kotze, Doctor Dr. Donovan Kotze had established a good working relationship with the community. So I think those are some of the like, partnerships that the, 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 the university might need to look at. But of course, we are also willing, willing to drive the process of linking the institution with, with, with the community, yeah. Yeah, um, thanks, Becca. I think it's a, it's a good point that uh, if, we, if we are planning to do um, research in these areas that we do, uh, provide a little summary and so people will so you can communicate that and so people can know like what exactly is going to be happening on the land like if we do need to perhaps dig up something or um, you know we're taking samples or if we're just coming there to observe or I think it's, it's really good to just make sure that um, landowners know what's happening um, or, or that you know they're just aware of like what exactly it, it'll entail if they you know if if researchers are coming it's just like such a broad time and there's so many different things and like you know to just to know okay we're bringing in equipment or you know we're setting up like maybe camera traps or something you know and there's going to it's going to be out there for so long it's it's just good um i think good practice from a researcher side to make sure that um that what you're going to be doing is understood um yeah so you just uh, you create those good relationships and and uh, yeah and we can just further build from that um, and then people yeah. who are coming afterwards can just, uh, 
you know, and then there's some sort of understanding, at least with the locals, of like what what it sort of means when people are coming here, um, yeah, and what yeah. they're looking to do. Yeah. Yes, definitely. Um, there was a, um, a response to Nokwanda from Terry uh, about DEMOS. Uh, DEMOS is a planning tool to identify potentially uh, environmentally sensitive and irreplaceable land. Uh, it is not a formal protection. Environmental co uh, conservation reserve is only applied to municipal owned conservation areas. Um, yeah, so I think that's a, that's a very good point and something to consider that just because it is under DEMOS does not mean that it um, that it is formally protected. Um, there's a lot more uh, that goes into proclaiming and uh, protection, if I recall. Um, and it's a, it's a bit of a complicated process at times. Um, is there any um, other points anybody would like to, to raise? Or anything you'd like to discuss? Okay, so I think um, oh, Nakwanda says uh, DEMOS is one of the tools used to guide environmental protection. Um, yeah, so I think it's uh, it's just um, as Terry was saying, it just highlights those areas that could potentially be um, sensitive, and uh, and then it's sort of taken from there about the level of protection and um, that happens with it. So. Um, Becca, if you just stop sharing your screen, I will share mine and just um, to share uh, just some contact details because I think we can we can perhaps uh, close up if there's nothing uh, more that people would like to discuss. Um, so if you'd like to be a part of the uh, DRAP network, uh, you can email me and just let me know. So um, I send out, uh, it's just it's just to be in the loop of when there are like potential uh, vacancies or if there's workshops, if there's, you know, conferences and things. Uh, sometimes I just distribute out an email, um, you know, invites for seminars, things like that. So if you are interested and you're not on the DRAP list and you don't really receive these, um, just uh, email me. My email address is on the screen. And then, um, yeah, I can add you to that and then send, uh, you'll be part of that list uh, um, uh, and, and get those notifications. And then also, if you would like to volunteer for future biodiversity surveys in these areas. So um, as we mentioned, um, we did try last year to, to create sort of um, two days where, where potential researchers could just go out and actually physically visit a site and then sort of assess it because it's 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 different to see it, you know, when you see it on a map and, you know, you see pictures of it, but it's, it's very different when you actually get there and then you can plan research and, you know, figure out your logistics and things like that. Um, so that was the idea that we had and we were hoping that people would be able to visit. Um, we, we picked one of the areas and, you know, the idea was that you could go out and then sort of assess it and then make a plan and uh, see and then work out, you know, like, when do you need to come if you need to sample seasonally, if you would need to, you know, bring equipment in like what it would, what it would really mean and all of that. Um, but unfortunately, yeah, as we, as we mentioned, that fell through because it was it was actually that week um, that the first lockdown and uh, it was just very confusing and, and uh, people were just sort of scrambling and uh, it kind of fell through. So we we don't know what's happening with um, COVID at the moment. I hope everybody's, um, you know, hopefully planning to get vaccinated um, and um, we'll, we'll see how things sort of change in the coming months. But uh, for our future plans is we do have that idea that we would like to do um, these sort of uh, visits again to these areas where we could maybe get, um, you know, a group of people who are interested, pick a few days that people might be available um, let Becca know so he can let the, the local communities know and we can um, maybe like physically visit these places and, you know, um, sort of assess what's going on and then make plans um, for how we'd want to maybe get the biodiversity um, information. So, um, 
if you'd like to be part on the, if you'd like to be on that uh, volunteer list, I do have an email list. Um, and uh, yeah, just send, send me an email and um, with your full name and what sort of expertise you should be provide. So if you, um, you know, are good with plants or, you know, if you, if you with birds, with mammals, whatever, if, you've, if you're an entomologist and you can identify insects and things. So then we can possibly make teams together and we can start to maybe work together and uh, perhaps survey some of these areas and, and come up with, uh, with different things we could do. Maybe we could do uh, workshops out in these places and maybe get the local communities involved and just, you know, teach them a little bit about, uh, you know, as Becca said, like the management is sort of all over the place. So it, it might be nice if, you know, maybe we could, we could have like a little something about like, you know, burning and what does it mean and what does it do and, um, you know, how, uh, how best practices are, things like that. I think it would be, um, it would be nice to, to think about all these types of things that we could do in future. Um, so yeah, so please drop me an email if you want to be part of the DRAP network or if you want to be on that volunteer list. And um, I have recorded this uh, this um, session, so um, I'll see if I can if I can get it up onto maybe uh, the UKZN website on the on YouTube or something, and uh, so other people could maybe uh, could maybe see. Uh, this presentation and we could get more interest. Um, so what you can do is firstly, just think about like, if you are planning research in Etiquini, sort of consider these areas, don't, um, you know, sort of just exclude them just because it's like maybe a little bit difficult to access or the landowner permission is a little bit, you know, there are ways that we can, um, we can get to these places and they, they are, uh, important, as Becca showed, like a lot of them are very important in terms of um, the, the, the upper catchments, you know. Um, so, yeah, so just think about it in your research, include it in your research, maybe talk to your colleagues as well about um, about these areas, you know, if they're considering doing research and say, you know, hey, there's, this, there's these places where there's limited biodiversity information. So if you, you know, are doing a project, consider, you know, these being one of maybe your study sites. Um, yeah, so these are the ways that you can sort of help us out. And if you do come across any information um, already on these sites, like uh, any biodiversity information that actually exists for, you know, for these areas, do let us know. Um, so we can just add to it and then we can sort of um, fill the gaps. As Becca said, we don't want to reinvent the wheel. If it's already been done, it would be nice to um, just continue, you know, or, or add to it or, you know, just fill in the gaps. Um, so thank you, everyone. We'll, we'll, we'll stop the... We'll stop the session here. Thank you so much for, for showing interest and for, for the interesting discussions. Um, yeah, and I think we, this is just a start. We, we, we have a lot more plans uh, for, for just, you know, filling in the gaps and um, really helping with getting the biodiversity information so that it can be, um, you know, so that we can plan, Etiquini can plan a little bit better and actually conserve much better um, in these areas. Thank you, everybody. Bye.